Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to PJTN's education webinar. We're excited to have you here um, today. And as you know, this is a very um, special day in history as we commemorate Kristallnacht, which, which was one of the Nazis' um, pogroms, one of the worst pogroms really in documented history. And it is a great honor as, a, as an award-winning film producer to have to interview another award-winning Oscar-nominated um, documentary film and fil film producer and director. And I want to introduce to you Emmanuel Rund, but before I introduce you to him, I want to also reiterate how critically important it is, this program that we are documenting. I was reminded recently about General Eisenhower when he liberated the concentration camps. He reminded the people, he told the people that were there, that were present, to document everything they see. Because someday in the course of history, some bastard, his words, not mine, was going to say this didn't happen. And many of our PJTN watchmen know that we have been at the forefront of calling for the removal and resignation of William Latson, who was a high school principal in Boca Raton, Florida, for telling a parent when she asked him about the history of the Holocaust, um, what they were teaching in her child's school. And he replied that there, that he as a public school employee could not respond because there are some people who don't believe that the Holocaust is actually a factual historical event. So as a filmmaker, we understand, both Emmanuel and I, understand the responsibility we play in documenting this history for future generations. Because again, 82 years from now, someone will also try to say this didn't happen. So it is a great honor um, that we have Emmanuel run. Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great honor to have you. I'm a tremendous admirer of the work that you do, the work that you've done in compiling history for us and for future generations on this very important topic, especially as we commemorate Kristallnacht. And so welcome to PJTN. It's a great honor to have you today. Thank you, Laura and PJTN for inviting me. Thank you. Absolutely. So for our audience, I want to give you all a, back, a little background on Mr. Run. And he, not only is he a critically acclaimed director, producer, of 240 films, but he has also produced 30 films on German Jews and the Holocaust. And that's why it's very important that we have this opportunity to meet with him and document what he has experienced and what he has captured. Because Emmanuel, um, you're gonna talk a little bit in just, just a while about your own personal experience because Kristallnacht was not just an incident that you are documenting and you're sharing you have a personal connection, but you also are the owner of two major unique archives of historical, cultural, social, and religious productions and activities in the United States, Israel, and Europe. And the archives are located at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas in Dallas and will serve as a major resource for international Holocaust research. In fact, we are excited about being able to introduce your important work to the Department of Education here in Florida as we are um, putting together, drafting the standards, the Holocaust standards for the state of Florida. So thank you so much um, for all of this work that we are going to be able to share with future generations, not just in Florida, but across the country. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that you also were the initiator of the January 27th International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which we all celebrate now um, every year, thanks to you and the hard work that you did, the persistence um, that you stayed, you continued to ask for, and now that hard work and that persistence is paying off. Um, you also coined 
um, you, you are often been coined as the Renaissance man. And so um, not only are you um, an esteemed film producer and director, but one of the interesting facts about you, Emmanuel, is that you're a rabbi and a cantor. So you also come at this as a historian, but also as a religious leader. And that's so important to our audience at Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, because you know, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, the mission of our organization is to educate Christians about their biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren, defend the state of Israel against the rise of global anti-Semitism. And we accomplish our goals, as I mentioned, by producing documentary films and distribute them, distributing them around the world. But Emmanuel brings that extra added component, not just as a historian, but helping us to understand from a biblical um, position why we should be standing with our Jewish brethren, why righteous Gentiles during the, the time of the Holocaust stood with our Jewish brethren. And so Emmanuel is going to bring that um, to us for, for us today as well. So it's a great honor to have you on the program, Emmanuel. And I want to start first by giving a little background on Kristallnacht because you know, that event in history wasn't, it didn't just happen out of a vacuum. It just, the Nazis didn't wake up one day and decide we're going to go and destroy all these Jewish businesses. We're going to smash them in. We're going to start killing the Jews. Give us a little background on the history of how Kristallnacht actually happened. What was going on in Germany and Europe at that time that preceded this horrific event? Well, in Germany, there were about 500,000 Jews living in Germany, less than 1% of the population. And they brought 25% of the Nobel Prize. They, they built Germany with art and culture and science and everything. But there was always anti-Semitism. And at some point, Hitler decided to go on that wave and to go against the Jews. And uh, so it was in November 1938, uh, some of the Jews have left Germany, but many of them could not leave. They didn't know where to. No country wanted to take the Jews in, including the U.S. They brought very few Jews in. Canada brought only a few hundreds of Jews. Can you imagine? They're trying to escape Nazi Germany, and they don't know where. And uh, then uh, at some point in November, uh, the Germans... Uh, they collected all the Jews in Germany who had uh, uh, Polish identity cards. They were Polish Jews living in Germany, and the Nazis collected them, about uh, 17,000 of them, mm -hmm. and they brought them back to Poland, so to say. Mm -hmm. But on the border, the Pol Polish government didn't want the Jews. So they were left on a field without any facilities, no sanitation, no nothing. And they were there, they were given some food from Jewish community someplace in the area. And uh, one, one couple, uh, they sent, actually the daughter sent a letter to her uh, brother, Herschel Greenspan. He was illegally living in Paris and she told him about the terrible situation and Herschel Greenspan was very angry at the situation that he was able to penetrate the, the uh, German embassy in Paris and shooting von Rath, one of the German diplomats over there. He didn't kill him, he injured him with two shots, but uh, this von Rath uh, died two days later. That was a good reason for the Nazis to go for the long time planned, as you have said, Laurie, uh, to go against the Jews. And they organized all the Nazis all over Germany, uh, including neighbors in many towns, many cities, on the evening of the 9th of November through the night of the 10th, the morning or beginning of the 10th of November. And they uh, started to turn on fire all the synagogues, hundreds of synagogues, uh, Jewish schools, Jewish old age homes, everything Jewish, they turn on fire and uh, that was the uh, 
pogrom night called the Kristallnacht. The German called it Kristallnacht, about the crystal, about the glasses that were all over because not only synagogues were destroyed, but also thousands of Jewish homes and businesses, storefronts, and all the glass was all over Germany, uh, split over there. And so that's why they called it uh, the Kristallnacht. We called it the night of the November pogrom or the night when the glasses were broken or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, it was a, a horrific night indeed. And of course, we know that before proceeding this evening, the Nazis were already singling out the Jews in Germany. We know that it is documented that they revoked the citizenship of the Jews. Um, German schools, Jewish students in German schools were forced out of the schools. They boycotted the Jewish stores, banned Jews from a large number of professions. And of course, on occasion, they would take the Jews to concentration camps. But on that night, that horrific night, November, 9th through the 10th. And you know, as I was doing the research and just reviewing again about Kristallnacht, something that really hit me because, Emmanuel, I don't know if you and I talked about this, but I started the organization six months following 9-11. 9-11 was like a wake-up call for me. And um, the reason why I saw 9-11 as significant and why it connected us to Israel was because Amalek. Um, we were blindsided on that horrific. And unfortunately, that is the strategy that Amalek used. So I, I have a personal connection to that. But on Kristallnacht, it was, we were living, German Jews were living in an environment where there was already tension going on in the community. And this really, this pogrom was what, what launched us into this full-blown Nazi annihilation of the Jewish people. But as I said earlier, you have a personal connection to this, this horrific event. Your family, your, your grandfather was a rabbi, um, and he actually lived in one of the synagogues. And as you mentioned, there were 1,500 synagogues and schools, Jewish day schools, that were targeted on Kristallnacht. Tell us about your family's experience. Yeah, so my mother's family, they actually, I'll go back a little bit, they left the Spanish uh, Catholic Inquisition in Spain and Portugal, 1492. They left with a rabbi of town, Rabbi Isaac Abarbanel. They went to Venice. They lived in a ghetto of Venice. They still suffered from the Catholic Church over there. So they decided to join the family that moved already directly from Spain and Portugal uh, to um, Amsterdam and Hamburg, which were not Catholic, were Protestant countries. And the Jews can had, could have better living situation over there, so my mother's family left there. They settled in a small town between Hamburg and Amsterdam, which sometimes used to be a Dutch uh, area. And uh, in that town, my grandfather, Rabbi Joseph Wolfs, W-O-L-F-F-S, -O -F -F Wolfs, uh, he was a rabbi of town. There were about 300 Jews living in that relatively small town. Everybody knew each other, the Jews and the non-Jews. And uh, my mother used to tell me she used to go with her Christian friends to the church uh, to hear the music over there. And her Christian friends used to go with her to the synagogue to hear the Jewish liturgy. And they lived beautifully until that time came about. Now, my mother... Uh, her father, the rabbi, was uh, arrested already in August 33 by the Nazis. And so the, the parents, my grandfather, decided that the daughter, my mother, Ruth, Ruth Wolves, uh, should leave Germany. And she left for Holland, Groningen, Groningen, in Holland, and lived by the rabbi's house over there. 
And then um, I came there in 1985 to make my first film in Germany about that town by the name of Leer, L-E-E-R. Uh, in German, it's Leer. And um, the film is called Leer Until When, with many open questions about the whole past and future. And uh, I made that film. And part of the film was uh, we organized an event, memorial event, to 100 years to the synagogue, beautiful, great synagogue uh, that was built 1885. And it was 1985 that we commemorated, so to say, the erection of the synagogue. But it was destroyed on 1938, on that terrible night. Yeah, my uh, grandparents. Ida and Josef Wolfs, they had a residency in a big, tall synagogue uh, inside. And they, you know, they were sleeping. And then uh, on that night, uh, the, the, you know, the brutal Nazis and some of the neighbors were happy to, you know, to hurt the Jews out of anti-Semitism and jealousy and you name it. And they turn on fire, they turn the synagogue on fire about two or three in the morning. And then my grandparents woke up that there was, uh, you know, everything was, they couldn't breathe. And they managed to escape this time uh, to the Jewish school and they lived there. And uh, yeah, so that was, they were taken later on to Riga in Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and they were shot over there. Uh, by the Nazis, 1942. Yes, there are so many members of the Jewish community who share that personal experience, um, unlike many people. And I was, you know, I was having a conversation with someone about this um, the other day and how the one thing that Jews share is that almost everybody, if not 100% of all Jews here in the United States have personally lost someone in the Holocaust, a family member. There are children, and this this did not occur to me. I didn't I didn't think about this, but this is something for our audience to think about, especially Christians, that we grew up with our grandparents. There are many Jews who have no grandparents, and so when their children go to public schools and they have grandparents day. There are no grandparents for these Jewish kids. There are no great grandparents for these Jewish students. That's terrific. But let's talk let's talk about the the religious or the spiritual component of what was going on during this time, Emmanuel, because Germany happened and Europe, let's just, you know, carpet the whole European continent. Most of the people in Europe, the majority were Christians, some Catholic, some Protestant, but they all had a faith in God, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But unfortunately, Emmanuel, as I've documented many times, that Jews were slaughtered. Six million Jews were sent to their deaths under the watchful eye of Christians in their community. You just talked about what your grandparents experienced in Germany, that there were their neighbors that also participated in the pogrom, helping to burn down the day schools, the Jewish schools, and the, the synagogues in Germany. But I also am reminded of Poland, there was a town in Poland, in Jedwabne, where 1,600 Jews lived. And they lived alongside their neighbors for generations. And their neighbors pushed them all into a synagogue and set their synagogue on fire. Right. We also know, Emmanuel, about the righteous Gentiles, that there were Christians who did help, try to help, to rescue Jews, to rescue the Jewish children. Tell us a little bit about that experience because you've worked a lot with the Christian 
community, both in Europe and here in the United States and around the world and helping to inform them. Tell, talk a little bit about that relationship that you have and why it is so critically important from a spiritual aspect, but also practically why Christians must stand up and speak out because they didn't and they allowed six million Jews to die and another five and a half million other people under their watchful eye. Yeah, in the United States, I was part of the Christian Jewish Relations Board together with Rabbi Mark Tenenbaum. And we used to go to different Christian communities, meet with them and, and do whatever we have to do to keep the friendship and unity because we are people and we believe in God and we have the Bible and uh, we pray and uh, so uh, and then when I came to Germany I served not only that I made those 30 films I also served as a rabbi cantor in 15 communities all over Germany on Sabbath and the holidays uh, and uh, of course I was asked to be also on the board of the Christian Jewish Relations Board in Germany and that enabled me and us uh, to meet very often with the Christian community and to, so to say, I say, to make sure that nothing happens again. And to, if the other side knows you, they wouldn't hate you. The problem was through, through 2,000 years of Jews in diaspora, mainly in uh, Europe, <clears throat> that uh, most of the, you know, Christians, didn't know the Jews well enough. They didn't know what they do. They didn't know what they do in a synagogue. They never went there. Even if they would be invited, they were afraid or whatever. And they didn't know. And they made the Jews a Satan, you know, and that's helped them, so to say. Of, of course, the issue of uh, <clears throat> that they claim that Jews killed uh, Jesus and Jesus was a Jew, so the Jews couldn't have killed him. It was the Romans and their collaborators who did it. But Jews suffered massacres, pogroms throughout the 2000 years. Um, in the 11th century, when uh, the, the Christians went to conquer the, the Holy Land from Spain, from France, through Germany, they killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews in every community, they destroyed all the communities. And they, uh, uh, so it was always a problem. And Jews were, you know, looked upon as, you know, a different race that is under the Christian. The Christians are the best and the Jews are the bad people. And so the Jews didn't have the power to go and be more with the, with the Christians around them. But that's what we tried to do. and successfully to be together with Christian communities and to go and join them. And that's what I still do till today. I produced a documentary, The Forgotten People, Christianity and the Holocaust, which you're familiar with. And in that film, I documented this, an aspect of this. How could, how could people of faith sit back and allow six million Jews be led to the slaughter. And as a spiritual leader, Emmanuel, how do you reconcile that? Because you just talked about educating and get, helping Christians to know their neighbor. In Yedwabne and in Germany, as we talked about, many of the Jews, in fact, all of the Jews had Christian neighbors, but they sure. didn't see, and it's because of what you said, it's because of 2000 years of persecution, because the early church leaders who were actually Jewish were not anti-Semitic. They didn't have the same perception that Martin Luther had, unfortunately. Um, there were people like John Chrysostom and Marcion, some of the early Gentile leaders that pulled Christians from their Hebraic foundation, from their Hebraic roots, because as you um, ad adequately said and perfectly said that Jesus was a Jew. And the early church leaders actually followed, studied the Torah. 
But as we, as the church moved further and further away from Judaism, that's when the hatred came in. And of course, we know with Martin Luther, um, who wrote the Jews in their lives. I'd like for you um, to talk a little bit about how Martin Luther's writings influenced the culture and the climate in Germany against the Jews. Yeah, Martin Luther in Leipzig in Germany, he came out, uh, already his father was very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, and he wrote this terrible book about the Jews, a uh, terrible uh, book, And but uh, many people followed him as he made change, you know, from Catholicism to Protestantism, and uh, many people followed him and followed his, you know, anti-Semitic uh, feelings and, and actions. And uh, that spread all over the Protestant lands, uh, Germany, Holland, uh, but mainly Germany. And uh, yeah, that was something that nobody could, so to say, bring back the will or correct it. And that was part of the influence, the influence, in that case, Germany and Hitler, of course, to go against the Jews. Hitler was very much, of course, anti-Semitic and based on the 2000 years of the way Jews were treated in Europe, even sometimes in the Arab countries, but mainly we're talking about Europe, uh, that uh, they couldn't do anything. They didn't have an army, they didn't have power. They only could only beg always to the king or to the bishop or to the prince, uh, please don't let us live, you know. They used to give him whatever they could earn and give him some money or jewelry just to let them, you know, live. And I made one film uh, in Israel with five German Jews who tell about anti-Semitism in Germany and how was it to live next to the Christian neighbors. So, of course, often there are nice stories, friendly, but often it's not the case. And often it's uh, <clears throat> the case of all those Christians who would go over the pulpit or in the universities and just declare all their anti-Semitic theories, and everybody believed them. And uh, that uh, was for hundreds of years, generally speaking. And uh, for me, it was um, hard to see how I dealt with three-generation Germans and three-generation Jews, the survivors, the Jewish side, the second generation, my generation, and the third generation, our children. But I dealt also with the, with the German side. There were many times children of Nazis <clears throat> asked me to help them to work out their problems psychologically. And we did lots of projects with them and helped them. My main concern was with the youngsters in Germany. As I made those 30 films about the Holocaust and I, in German, and uh, is Germany the target audience, especially the youngsters, to teach them the past, but to teach them to be against genocide and, you know, to uh, human rights and everything. And I, whenever I screen my films in film festivals in Germany or in movie theaters, cinematheques, in church communities, in schools, you name it, sometimes came to me young Germans and they say, Mr. Rund, or Rund in German, uh, I want to tell you something. I don't know what my grandfather did during the war because he doesn't want to tell me. And I could always think about the terrible things that he could have done, but I have no idea. But every time I see a film about Auschwitz, <clears throat> I keep thinking, was my Opa Adolf over there, part of those Nazis? And I realized that there were millions millions of such young Germans in Germany who suffer because of what their uh, grandparents did. When the Bible tells us when the parents eat the sour grapes, the teeth of the youngsters will go bad. And that's what happened in Germany. And there are millions of young Germans over there, and I noticed it. I decided I would like to help them. Uh, I, I thought the best way for them will be to meet Jews. Now, Jews in Germany is hard to meet because they're afraid of their German neighbors till today. And they kind of hide in the bunkers, so to say, virtually. And uh, I knew that the 
best Jews for that uh, thing would be Jews in Israel. The Israelis are very open. So I organized a group of youngsters youngsters from that small town where I filmed my first film, where my grandfather was a rabbi. I took youngsters from that town to Israel. I organized a meeting with 120 of family members of Jews who descendants of that town. And I organized a party in Jerusalem across from Mount Zion. And, uh, and they met each other and the Israelis invited the youngsters. And uh, eventually, uh, we went also to Yad Vashem on the Holocaust Memorial Day, Yom HaShoah, and uh, it was a full program. Some of those young Germans who suffered, they came back to Germany very strong. They lost all that fear and all those psychological problems. Some of them even stayed in Israel. Some of them even converted to Judaism. And some of those even studied in Yeshivot in Jewish learning schools. And, but in Germany, after I was back in Germany, I was invited to a big event in Hamburg uh, City Theater. 2,000 people where the president of Germany, Horst Köhler, uh, <clears throat> told me, Mr. Rand, it's nice that somebody is doing something for our youth, and it must be you, a Jew from New York, so I said, thank you, Mr. President. I enjoy doing it and I'll keep doing it as my grandparents in Germany, both on both sides, helped the Germans around them. So that was part of the activities that I've done to contribute to this situation. That's an amazing story. You know, it reminds me when I was in high school and we were studying about the Holocaust. This was back in the 70s. And I went to public school, high school in Broward County, Florida. And I remember when we were studying about the Holocaust, um, it was so, it so overwhelmed me because I had family from Spain, Portugal, but my mother's side of the family came from Germany. And I immediately had a personal connection to that, thinking, you know, what did my great grandparents do? Because my great grandparents now were living in the United States and I was never able to speak with them because they spoke German. They didn't speak any English, so we couldn't communicate. But I remember asking my grandmother, um, what did our family do to help the Jews against the Nazis? Right. And I remember my grandmother yelled at me. And she said, that is the past and we will not discuss it. I walked away, my grandmother had never yelled at me, but I walked away from that. I didn't say another word to her about it for the rest of her life. And I walked away thinking, oh my gosh, did my family, were my family involved with persecuting the Jews with the Nazis? Of course, it was later on that I found out that my, my family were descendants of Jews. And her response to me was she didn't want to tell me who we were, that this was tradition. And just like you talked about um, your ancestors coming over from Spain, from the Inquisition, but the Barbanel, who is a very well-respected leader um, still to this day, his name, um, everyone knows who he is. And there was a strand of our family, the Cardozas, who ended up in Amsterdam. Of course, our family, my grandparents' line, stayed in Portugal and ended up in the Azores. But this really does have, um, it does connect us to an important part of history and what our responsibility is. And even if, um, as we're talking to, talking about this issue and we have an audience that may not have Jewish ancestry, but their family came from Europe. Um, this is something for us in our generation to understand, and especially from a biblical perspective. You know, I was reminded, you were telling me about how you've been helping Christians to deal, especially in Germany, to deal with the, the consequences of their ancestors, their great-grandparents, and the role that they played in helping the Nazis. Um, and of course, we know with Martin Luther and his teachings, the Jews and their lives, um, the, the book that Martin Luther wrote that Hitler actually quoted from. 
But I'm reminded that in the latter days, the prophet Isaiah said that 10 men from the nations will come and grab hold of the seat seat of a Jew and say, we want to go with you because we know that God is with you. So for how many generations did these Gentiles not see the importance of the Jewish community and what they brought to humanity? Um, the Torah, um, the, to learn about Israel's God. So I, I just commend you for the incredible work, the foresight that you had to see, to, to reach out to this Gentile Christian audience to help them to understand and connect. Because, you know, as we were talking about earlier, there were neighbors, the Jews had neighbors that were Christians and they knew them, but they didn't know them. And they didn't right. understand from a biblical perspective why right. they should protect the Jews in their community. Yeah. You see, my films, the 30 films that I made were mainly for Germany, but of course for the whole world. And in one film that entered the Oscars competition called All Jews Out, I was able to do beautiful uh, project where I brought from the United States, from New York, I brought to Germany a family who survived their concentration camp Terezin, Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia where the Nazis took them. They were there three years. Both parents and the daughter, Inge, survived. And I took that family from New York, 1988, for the 50 years anniversary of the pogrom night there, so-called Kristallnacht. And we did an event in the evening in front of the synagogue place, where it used to be a synagogue, and together with the mayor of town, and with that family and other Jews who came over, and I started filming three films simultaneously about that story for different target audiences, different length. And uh, in that town, I managed to get high school kids to do the interviews with the Jews who came over and with the Germans of town. From the Germans of town, I was able to detect uh, one old man was the head of the Nazi party of that town. He was responsible for everything. And I was able to get him to be interviewed on my film. I was able to get the good German, uh, uh, good Samaritan, who wanted to take out the burning synagogue. He was the head of the fire department. And he wanted to do something about it but he was threatened by the Gestapo not to do it, let the synagogue burn. So he was on the film. And as I was filming in the concentration camp, in the concentration camp Terezin, I was able to locate in Stuttgart, a German woman who was part of the Nazi headquarters of that same concentration camp. And she knew very well, I wouldn't say how well, but very well, the commanders, the SS Nazi commanders of the camp, and she knew also very well Adolf Eichmann, who was responsible for deportation of the Jews to their death camps. And he came to Theresien, Theresienstadt, she befriended him, and she was able to tell me on camera, on my film, All Jews Out, how terrible it was for the Jews in that camp without really enough food hardly any water, hardly any sanitation or running water, and with a fear that every day they'll get collected on the list and will be, so to say, shipped to Auschwitz to the gas chambers. Uh, gas chambers. And uh, yeah, so this film entered the Oscars because it was interesting that you see two sides talking about the same situation in that small town of that family and in the concentration camp. And so I made many films and screened them and educated the young Germans. Many of them became very good people about human rights and ecology and you name it. And uh, of course, friends of Jews in Israel, still Jews in like in America, in Germany, in Europe, are being threatened with terror. You know, they come from anti-Semitic, uh, uh, Nazi, neo-Nazi roots and uh, 
or uh, militant Islams or whatever, and Jews suffer. And I always try to get uh, different communities to help them over there because they're really under threat of death. I was myself under threat of death because when I was in Germany, I was invited like once a week or so to appear on German television or radio or newspaper to tell about what I was doing about this reconciliation project and keeping the memory alive so it won't happen again. And so everybody in Germany knew me. And whenever I screen my films, uh, I would screen one film and lecture in the lobby of that movie theater or church community, or whatever, I hung the posters of my other films with my name, my address, and my phone number. And I told the audience, listen, I came to Germany for a dialogue with them. We want to continue together. So if there's anybody of you who would like to ask me questions now, or if anybody of you would like to call me or visit me, ask me questions or tell me anything, uh, you can go and copy my address and phone number. And of course, I got lots of letters from Nazis and neo-Nazis with a big swastika saying, dirty Mr. Rand, get out of our country. Don't tell our children about Holocaust that never happened. And we'll get you, we'll kill you. And so I was not afraid because I went with God as the famous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rabbi Schneerson of Chabad of New York, he predicted already 1980 that I'll go to, as he said, enemy land. I'll do good work over there, but I'll get hurt. But as he said, you'll go with God and God will, will go with you. And that's what happened until a point I couldn't stand it anymore. And I came back to New York and then to Israel and traveling. But I continue to make films. I make film about the, also, as you know, the, the descendants of the of the uh, Anusim, the Jews who were converted forcefully, and I'm doing a film about Polish Jews who were saved during the war by Jews from Zurich, uh, Switzerland, uh, the Sternbuch family, but also by the Catholic Polish neighbors. There were some good, you know, righteous uh, Gentiles, and so I'm doing a film to you to give them our thanks you know for doing what they did and and a film about my jerusalem so that's wonderful and i'm looking at the clock and i know we're coming close to um closing this time with you and i want to just remind our audience um, because I want you to share with them how they can reach out to you and they can follow the work that you're doing. But I also, I don't want to lose or leave this interview without reminding our audience that this is a commemoration interview. This is to commemorate again, or to remember, to memorialize the 6 million Jews who died. And of course, it was all, it all started on the night of broken glass or Kristallnacht. What I want to remind us, our audience, is that Kristallnacht happened on the ninth day of the 11th month, 9 11. Right. And that number is significant to us in the United States because of the horrific attack we experienced on 9-11. But the six million Jews that lost their lives, this program is dedicated to their memory. And as we continue to commemorate this day, every year we are remembering that their souls will know that we have not forgotten. And we will do everything that we can, Jews and Christians, to stand against these atrocities and will not allow another Holocaust to happen. God told Abram in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And all the nations of the world shall bless themselves by you, Abram. And ladies and gentlemen, that is who we are. 
that is our responsibility to our Jewish brethren. And Emmanuel, we are just so honored to have you here. I feel like this has been a, a holy moment in time that we were able to capture the story and have you share with our audience so that we can remember and to honor those six million Jews who lost their lives because their neighbor didn't speak up on behalf of their life. Emmanuel, how can our audience learn more about the work that you're doing? Where can they um, get information or if they have questions, where can they reach you? Well, they can uh, just Google Emmanuel Rund, R-U-N-D, and uh, can take it from there. There's an uh, email address that I can give. It's filmme at aol.com, F like in, I mean, like film, like F like in Frank, I like Israel, L like in Larry, double M Y at aol.com. And uh, I'm traveling between the US, lecturing over there and Europe, doing the same, and Israel, and doing lecturing, teaching people uh, to learn about the history. And one, one address in history we know since 2000 years, and that's the 9 11 that we commemorate every Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the 11th month of Av, on the two days that are both temples in Jerusalem were destroyed by the Romans and the Greeks 2000 years ago, and we still remember it every year, we commemorate it in our synagogues. And so 9-11 has a long history, and that was unfortunately what the Nazis did was one another. Absolutely. Well, Manuel, thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you for the amazing work that you do. We're honored to have had this time with you, and we look forward to having you on the show again. And thank you, PJTN, Lori, for everything that you do. And I'll be glad to meet you at some point over there. And uh, again, if people want to reach me, they could try and reach you, and you could tell them how to reach me. Absolutely. And, and Emmanuel, you and I are going to work on a project together about right. the Anusim, about right. the Inquisition and what happened, because that was a horrific time in history that preceded the Holocaust. So yeah. it's important to tell that story as well. So God bless you. Keep up the great work. Okay. And we look forward to having you again. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. shalom.